Yeah, um, uh, I have two, two speakers here. Um, Angela Shuka, Harriet Chebet. Angela deals with books primarily. Chebet deals with hubs. So we will want to see how books and hubs <laughs> connect. Um, there's a phrase that's quite common. Everybody uses this phrase, so I'll use it, except it's a cliche. It's always very, very difficult to speak after your teacher has spoken, especially the teacher who insisted that it's in your interest to become a teacher. Um, and I think that my teacher has really raised very many contentious issues here. I think that Kimani, Professor Kimani Njogu actually invited me to this session because I posted somewhere a comment, and I said that I am not so sure that we can actually run the project of decolonization successfully on this continent. Because it's so, so difficult to actually think about how you decolonize knowledge. Because it is precisely in the school system that the so-called colonization still runs. And if you have a conversation with young people of the age of 25 and below, uh, it's likely that 90% of them have never read a history book. I was in a bookshop three days ago, and one of the oldest books on Kikuyu history by Liki is retailing at 23,000 shillings. And I told the book dealer, I can buy it, because I was taught that this is my heritage. But how do you convince a 25-year-old guy to buy a book that goes for 23,000 shillings? I think Angela will tell us about that, because they would preferably buy Hennessy or Glenfiddich or actually a new phone. So this is a very difficult conversation. We're not having this conversation because we will actually get a resolution. But I like saying that uh, the ear never gets hurt. It doesn't matter how many times you repeat what you're saying, the ear actually never gets hurt. So I think that by the time we leave this conversation tomorrow, we should go out as evangelists. I've always wondered about how a stranger um, alighted on the, uh, on the lake shore somewhere in Homa Bay, didn't know the local languages, and was bold enough to start a conversation about JC. And up to today, we swear by JC. And this stranger just arrived here and renamed him as Jesus Christus. So um, I want to invite Angela to speak first for 15 minutes about what she does. She has slides, and then I'll invite Harriet later, and then we'll have a conversation. May I ask that we actually have a conversation um, instead of this being talk from this end, hearing from the other end? Thank you very much. Angela? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tom Odiambo. I'm really glad to be here today. My name is Angela Washuka, one of the founders at Bookbank Trust. We work on restoring some of Nairobi's most iconic public libraries. We have just finished the architectural work on Kaloleni Library and the Eastlands Library in Makadara. And we're just now gearing up to do the same with the Macmillan Library, which is on Banda Street, located right in the heart of the city. I am thrilled to have been here for the keynote. Thank you so much, Dr. Joyce Nyairo. Everything that you said was so on point. Always learning from you um, and always very happy to. I'm going to zero in on two specific things that you spoke about, which were around knowledge production and the equity creation in that process. I do have some slides because I'd like to talk about specific ways in which we've tried to tackle these questions at Bookbank. I'll just wait for an indication from the back that we are good to go. Check. But we can keep the conversation going in the meantime yes, 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 while yes. we get ready. Yeah. So perhaps, Harriet? If you want me to yes. Yeah, you can say something. Okay, my name is uh, Harriet Ngok, and um, I run a company called Harriet's Botanicals, which is what we do is we retail traditional indigenous medicine, and we source it from the Southern Rift Valley, from the Kipsigis, Ogiek, and Maasai communities, and we are actually retailing to the urban African and diaspora markets. 
So when I say the urban, I mean the people who live in the cities, in Nairobi, in Mombasa, in Kisumu, who don't have the privilege that a lot of us had, or people who were born before us had, of going up country every holiday, or going up country regularly, and interacting with grandma and grandfather, and the healers, and everybody else in the community who knew about these traditional herbs. So what we do is we go and sort of like um, put together the knowledge and then bring it to Nairobi. We also retail in New York, we retail in Japan, we retail in Australia, anywhere that people are interested in using natural alternative medicine, th that, that is our target market. And in a sense, uh, when we talk about the young people, we engage with a lot of the youth, so to speak, especially people in their early 20s, because uh, one of our key products is for reproductive health for men and for women. So if you're looking for something alternative, you know, maybe for infertility or period pains or issues related to men's reproductive health, we provide those solutions from a traditional perspective, and that is how we interact with the young people. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the slides running? I'm not sure, so went on. Well, I mean, they, they, they just talked to us about oh. her books and young people, given that everybody talks about young people being unwilling to read. I, I'm, I'm, I don't agree with that. I don't agree that young people are unwilling to read. That's, that's what's <laughs> out there in the public. Um, and I do think that books do go quite well with the phone. There are a lot of people also using technology to do so. Um, but perhaps I can talk a little bit about uh, one of the projects that we have at the moment, which is around crowdsourcing um, public memory. Okay. So we have a project called The Missing Bits, which is supported by the Cultural Protection Fund. The Missing Bits is our reaction, or rather our intervention, to the fact that a lot of the archives that we have been digitizing at the Macmillan Memorial Library okay. reflect um, a sort of colonial record of the Kenyan experience. So what we're looking to do is get um, audio stories, get um, images and all sorts of recordings from the general public. And the idea is that you visit any one of those three libraries, you can archive your own material, material related to your family history, to your working history, any kind of memories around key moments in Kenya's history that you want to share with a, a bigger public, and we will then add that to the archive that exists that we're digitizing at um, the Macmillan Memorial Library. So this is our idea of trying not just to bring this archive alive, but also ensuring that the record of the archives that we have um, are much more representative. So they're not just a, a sort of colonial idea of who we are, if you like, because the material that we're looking at at the Macmillan is very, very old. It dates back to the 1800s. And so the view that is put forward of what the Kenyan experience is lacks our own input in it. One of the ways in which we're working with the general sort of ecology is with the Nest Collective, we'll be putting on exhibitions. Uh, with DocuBox, we'll be putting on film screenings that speak to some of the, the, the themes that Dr. Nyairo spoke about earlier. Those will be screening across all three libraries. Baraza Media Lab are co-curating panel discussions with us. The first one is next week, and we're looking at colonial legacies in media reporting. And then we've got um, Wairi Munduba, who's creating playlists that kind of date back to our own music. We've gone as far back as the 40s. So that's an intervention area that we're staging for those three libraries. Okay, I think the slides are running. I'm not sure, perhaps it's me. <laughs> Um, but we can continue with that. Yeah, just I'll so make sure that I... How, how do you draw young people into this kind of project? How do you draw them away from the phone into the book on the phone rather than the phone as the book itself? We're inviting them for that Missing Bits project to use the phone, um, to use some of these emerging technologies. We want to meet them um, at the devices that they're already using. So instead of saying, come out of that device and meet us at point A, uh, what we're saying is use that device and use it to either digitize your material or to share material with the public that you want, that you want um, a wider public to have access to. Another area um, where we make sure that we consult younger people and actually the general public is with community consultations before we begin work on these libraries. So we have these discussions that we stage mostly at Kaloleni Social Hall um, for that area or at Eastlands Library itself or at the Macmillan Library where we have young people tell us or give us feedback about the plans that we're proposing and you know what more they'd like to see in it. We have public tours as well, um, specifically for artists we've worked with quite a bit. We have public call-outs. We have artwork that's hanging across all the three libraries from public call-outs for Nairobi's artists to submit their work to us. 
Um, we do digital programming, so again, the phone, Dr. Odiambo. Uh, last year, we, we staged the NBO Lit Fest, which was purely digital, that you could access on, on any kind of social media platform. And that was a three-day festival celebrating the 90th anniversary of the Macmillan. And that festival um, was themed writing African cities. So we had tons of writers from across the world talking about that, talking about African cities, the experience of living in African cities, but also how they're relating to cultural assets and how these cultural assets should be reshaped to meet their experiences. Another key area I'd like to point out is uh, what we call HEPA Jam, which is our kind of response to just living, the practicalities of living in Nairobi yeah. and our traffic jams. So we've extended opening hours in the evening um, at traffic o'clock, so you can come into the library. We're open longer hours until 8 p.m. And during those times, we also have sessions um, that are specific to either homework clubs, if that's what you're looking for, curriculum material, and all sorts of programming for school-going children, for university people, um, and other people. Um, our interns tell wonderful stories. So if you look at our Instagram as well, you see that we really kind of center the people who are doing the work of digitizing these archives. And they get to tell us what they're experiencing. Sometimes it's very heavy things. You know, we've come across, for example, records of the first ever hanging in Kenya. What does that elicit in you? Um, one of the ways we try to get our interns to really demystify what these archives are is, for instance, you know, you'll come across an ordinance that sets up the Kenya High School or that renames it from the European School for Girls into the Kenya High School. Um, using the Missing Bits project, we're looking for people who can make that ordinance come alive. Were you a student there? What did that name change mean for you at that time? So our interns are really kind of crucial in not just um, digitizing the content, but digging out things that they have questions about. Because people their age are also going to have, likely, the same questions they do. Um, our interns also progress from just being interns into team positions. So at the moment, we have several who are working with us at that capacity as digitization associates. Um, the work that we do, um, restoring the libraries physically, we recruit locally, um, and some of those people also join our team, so they're working as facility managers, as security people, as janitors, as digitization associates as well. We have walls of fame. I really, really want you all to come visit mm -hmm. these libraries. Um, on the walls, some of the ways in which we include everyone that's working on the actual projects is we'll have walls of fame on the wall so you can see the faces of the people who did the work, and often, they can also showcase this to their children who are using the libraries as well. And for us, that's a really good way of creating a connection between not just the building, but also the work that's being done um, by the people who are working on it. Let's see if the slides are on. Are they running the slides? I think we've given up on the slides. Okay, fine. We're good. If, um, okay, uh, let, let's just go to, to um, um, Chebet. Okay. Uh, Chebet, uh, Angela is talking about um, reading the book, the book as kind of a representation of social life. So if you really, I mean, I was in a discussion yesterday and I was asking people, one of the things that happened in all our urban centers is that the social halls were grabbed or they were actually just demolished. So the idea that you could go to the library or the social hall to really uh, either interact with people or read or understand your social reality, just in a conversation, that has progressively disappeared. So um, the hubs about trees, about reading our environment, and you are actually producing hubs and selling them, but you see doing this uh, as well as a way of teaching young people about the env environment. Because we have an ecological disaster, and uh, where will you get hubs in the, in the next 10 years if everybody's cutting down the trees? Yes, yeah, so I mean, this is really, uh, really speaks to the heart of our work, Dr. Odiambo. So pretty much, when we, sp when we speak of, of cultural memory, ancestral memory, what are we talking about? The fact that your great-grandmother or your great-grandfather or anybody in that lineage knows about the trees, knows the names. I mean, I was actually in Bometheus yesterday, and I was walking around with these people, and they just kept pointing to trees and saying, Kelelwet, Soget. They were just naming them, naming them, naming them. And there were these kids following us around, and they would then name a few as well. So you can see that in the village, the practice of using the original cultural names, like our product is Arorwet, and Arorwet is a tree, a specific tree, and everybody knows it. So in the village, everybody knows these plants and these herbs and these trees and how they are used. 
at a minimum level, and then there's the practitioners. So we call that the ancestral mem memory because nobody's writing it down, but everybody knows it. So our intervention is that we write down these formulas, we write down the names of the trees in the original language, we actually do the research to find out the Latin names and the English names. So Arorwet, for instance, is known as Cape Ash in English, and um, Agerbia, something like Agerbia in um, Latin, or you have something like Tendwit. Tendwit is um, Punas Africana, which is very well known across Africa and across the world because of the fact that it is used by pharmaceuticals. So what we've done is we retain the traditional names. We find out the names in other communities. So that if we have Tendwit in Kalenjin, we also have it as Mweri in Kikuyu, and we go finding out what, what does the community call this tree? How is it used? And we document this in, in, you know, towards building a cultural archive. So sort of like where sort of like the interventionists, the, the modernists have come in, the people who have a Western education come in and then attribute, like take it from oral, make it written, digitize it because our social media platform is huge. You can check us out as Harriet's Botanicals on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube. We actually do YouTube videos of practitioners. We convert them to English and Kiswahili. And we are in the process of, we actually have um, videos in vernacular. We have videos in Luya, in Luo, in Taita, in Kikuyu, in Kamba. So this is our way of reaching more people. Now we are also opening in Rwanda. So we're going to translate some of this information to uh, Rwandan. At the same time, we want to uh, you know, look at what, the, what do the Rwandese do? What herbs do they use? What trees do they use? and then do a cross-cultural transformation, translation. And uh, the digital spaces are key and critical in our work. I mean, our biggest um, peop people actually find us on social media. We built a website because people said, oh, you have to be serious, build a website. But actually, 80% of people find us on Facebook, not even Instagram. Just, so you just since you came here, I mean, I can see a hub there that was used when I was here. Any that you see here before we jump back to Angel, any hub? There's plenty here see. because just, um, just, there's so many. There's one we call Laboto Twit. So where is it? So as you look for it, probably it's somewhere can go in back here to because Angel. I remember walking around and looking at these. These if were done. Don't, like if you just don't mind picking it and and, and bringing here and <laughs> right showing there's so many people. Let's see if I can find one. If you can find one. Okay. As she uh, Angela, as she finds one, yeah. um, would you just go back to the the archive? Oh, if you tell a young yes, if you could just look for one. <laughs> If you tell a young man the library, the archive, the understanding of that is a room, it's too many books, it's too much work, um, how, do you, how do you ensure that these, actually, these young people start to understand that the library, the archive, is no longer necessarily a room, too many books, and too much work? I think one of the ways that we do that is, is through programming. I, found one. I think for a very long time, libraries have been thought of as, as static, you know? And they evolve, of course, much like our own culture and everything else. So they're no longer just, at least we don't think of them as just, you know, repositories of all this paperwork and all these records and all these archives. They do serve that function and that is very, very key. But one of the ways in which we have attempted to bring these libraries alive is by introducing programming. So during the school holidays when kids are at home, at Eastland's library, 30 um, young people will be doing music lessons. It's an introduction to musical instruments. You can learn how to play the keyboard. Um, the curriculum that we have developed with Levi Wataka is global, but it's very centered on African instruments, on African songs, on African score sheets. Okay. Um, so programming is a really, really big way of, of bringing um, libraries, bringing these buildings alive. So. Hepa Jam homework clubs is one of them, right? So you can come into the library and get work, I mean, and get help with your homework. Um, that's also soon going to evolve into kind of skills workshop. You know, do you need to apply? Do you need to learn how to use the e-citizen platform to access certain crucial things <laughs> in your life? Um, you can do that through equipment that we have at the library, but you can also have someone train you how to use equipment where you don't know how to. Okay, we can run with the slides. Are they up? Yeah, there you go. Oh, there yeah, we go. Yeah, yeah. Boom. So that's storytelling, which I think maybe I'm the one that doesn't know how to work this. 
I'll start from programming because that's what we were just talking about. Speaking to me. Boom. Yes, so the missing bits, you can see that on your screens. Um, and that's the exercise that I just spoke about that we're encouraging members of the public to donate their archives. First of all, to come into the libraries, um, digitize their archives, and then if they so wish, they can also donate this to the archive that we are growing at the moment. Another area that I spoke about was community sessions. That's me with a very cute hairstyle. You can clap. Um, <laughs> the public tours that we do as well. We put people on a bus. Every Saturday you can book this experience. We do it at two levels. One is through Airbnb and another is one that you just book directly through us. Um, artist call out. Again, like I said, all the buildings are full of art. We also do huge call for applications so that we can co-curate events um, with the general public and with the artist community. And I see we're being joined by plants here. The NBO Lit Fest I also spoke about in terms of programming. Music Bank, um, Tafadalini, look up this program if you want your kids to sign up for this program at Eastlands Library. Very excited to be kicking that off on the 4th of April. HEPA Jam. And on the right also you'll see a photo of an intervention that we've done, which is around um, COVID-19. So we know the data about the children users, especially around Kaloleni Library, how old they are, what subjects they're studying, what they're interested in, and we're able to put together packs that reflect their experience. Um, our intern storytelling, I would really encourage you to look at our social media. They really do help us to debunk a lot of the stuff that we're finding in the archive. Podcast, storytelling, your favorite thing, the phone, Tom. Yes. Um, so a palace for the people, you can search for this anywhere. We're just about to go into season two. And there's some really great stories about material that we're finding in these libraries. Um, this is the transition that I spoke about, where we have interns also transition to join our team. That's Maureen Mumbua, who's our head um, digitization associate at the moment. And also recruitment from the community, where you have all these young people that help to shape these buildings into what they are today being absorbed into our team. That continues with our wall of fame, so you can see all the people that have worked on the libraries and the visibility. This is an archive um, that we've been building that um, I think we're about 70,000 archive, archives deep. NRB libraries, if you just search for that phrase online, you can create an account and you have access for free to all the archives that we have digitized. So I really encourage you to look at that. And we did that through the support um, of British Council's Cultural Protection Fund as well. So many thanks for that. This is us brainstorming all these different things that we want to do. That's another way that we involve everyone. This is one I'd really like to highlight. Um, we're calling it the library ecosystem research. So during the lockdown, we took time to research on the public libraries that are spread across Nairobi. And you'd be shocked at how many they are. They're actually a lot more than we think they are. Yeah. Um, and we want to put this up as a map online. At the moment, it's a map on the floor at Eastlands Library. So look at our website also for this research output. So if you're in Langata, for example, eventually you'll be able to search online and you can see what the nearest library to you is and what facilities they can offer you. That's just our 2021 in numbers and to point out the fact that we do all this research to, with a view to having it inform um, all our programming and everything else that we're doing. I'll stop there and hand over back to Harriet yes, so yeah. we can talk about yeah. these plants. Harriet has the book, the book of plants here. Oh, the book so of Harriet, plants. Please. Thank you for putting me on the spot. Yes. So... Um, Actually, a lot of these were done, as far as I know, by Tika, um, who work with indigenous knowledge, mm. and they plant, planted a lot of these small botanical gardens. And of course, they have a few obvious ones. This is, I think, probably what we can do. This one in my community is called Labo Twit, and it's Sodom's apple, and it produces a yellow fruit, which is kind of bitter. So maybe somebody can shout out from the audience what it is called in your community, because everybody has this. Yeah? Dongu? Dongu. 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 And that's Luo. <laughs> okay. In Luo. There are Luo's behind there. Ochok. Yes. Ojok. Ojok. Anybody else want to tell us what it's called in their community? Well, at least that's a start. We have like the same plant found in different parts of the country but um, pretty much does the same thing because the fruit is actually used to cure, to heal wounds, right? So that little uh, yellow berry that you see, you squeeze it, and when you have a cut or bruises, you squeeze it in. It's anti-inflammatory, antiviral, it's quite bitter, 
So that's typically that's how it works. This is a very famous one, aloe vera, you know, and there's different various forms of this one. In my community, we call it tangoro twit, tangoro twit in Kalenjin. So anybody else in their culture? Yeah, hello. Yes, shout it out. Hello. <laughs> Keruma. Keruma in what in what community? Kikuyu. Kikuyu. Wonderful. Anybody else? Ogaka. Ogaka. Luo. Luo. Okay. Any other, anybody else from the any other community? The Kambas have this. The Titus have this. Everybody has this. And everybody knows how far this has traveled, not necessarily from Kenya, but in terms of how it's used, aloe vera for face products, even for, um, you can brush your teeth with it, or it's used in toothpaste. In terms of aloe vera, it actually is used by all the pharmaceutical and all the beauty industry quite a bit. I have others not so well known. We use this a lot. It's all over this place. This is used for teeth. We have this one that is in everybody's community. It's actually like a fence, like, you know, a nature-made fence. And people use it to just like farm, to, to cut out, to make sure that the cows can't get into where you've planted your maize. This one is also medicinal. So my point is, this is what we call ancestral memory. You know, some people know it in their language. Others don't, you know. Others get to learn about it on the internet because now you can go to a plant app and take a photo of this and it will give you the exact name and how it is used. So that is how we are preserving. Then the fact that we can, that, you know, young people actually buy into this now if they buy aloe vera products, they already know about it. They may not know about it in their culture or in their language, but they do know about it. So this is sort of how, you know, ancestral memory is coming through into modern, sort of like into our modern societies and being documented. A hundred years from today, you'll be able to Google, let's say, Muiri or Ogaka or something, and you will find this was used in this community. In Kenya, it is used like this. In Tanzania, the Maasai do this with it, the Samburu, and that is how we are preserving or building cultural archives. Okay. Um, thank you very much, both of you. We have enough time to have intervention. A lot of time. This is a conversation. So there's the book of, of life there, and then there is the plant of life here. So let's have this conversation, please. You can't drink the tea without talking. It's unfair. Do some work, please. Okay, let's hear what you have to say. There are roving microphone, or people can just. Uh, there is a roving microphone. Oh, there's a hand at the back. Oh, okay. Oh, yes, yes. Both. Yes, I, I, I. Thanks a lot, really, uh, for this knowledge. Very, very powerful. My question is to Harriet. Um, I, if you could just tell us a little bit about um, whether you, you're working towards pa patenting some of that knowledge with the University of Nairobi. I remember you mentioned uh, direction in that way a while back, and how far might you have gone if that is the case? Okay. Uh, that I really appreciate knowing. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Actually, we, have, we now have patents for all our products. We have copyrights, patents, and trademarks. And this we did uh, at the beginning of last year. Um, it's a bit of an expensive process, but we, we just decided, especially our women's product is doing so well, copycat started coming up from everywhere. Mm. You, know, you know, we have a bit of a copycat culture where people now, they see something is successful, now everybody jumps on the bandwagon. So, you know, if you do try and market or sell my products as yours, I can easily sue you for five million shillings at least. <laughs> we are developing our, uh, our intellectual property rights in Europe, and in the US, because we have a big market in the US, and if we take our product there and somebody is able to extract the formula and we don't have protection, they, are, they will be able to actually sell and retail in their market. So that is something that we're really working towards because we want to also export. So yes, in, that's an answer to your question. Yes. My name is Sanya Luhova. And uh, thank you very much, the two discussants, for very, very elaborate things that you've done. I just want to pick up from where Professor Kimani Njogu left and uh, your answer. Um, and we're looking at the economics of all these things that you're doing. And so when you patent and have intellectual property rights to it, where is the role of the community? I'm sure you're getting this knowledge not on your own. You're investing in the community. How do you pl plow back some of these benefits so that it doesn't get into your company 
and then the community is thrown on the back burner? Yes, that's a great question. And um, we do have a community engagement program. Actually, that is why I was that side the last two days. And um, we work with 200 practitioners from the three communities and impact about 20,000 people. Because remember, we have people on the ground harvesting, we have people plant planting, we have training going on, and we have general meetings just to talk about preservation of the forest. Because now we have decided to take on, remember that Kipsigis, Ogiek, and Maasai, they surround the Mao complex, right? So if these, if these are our resources, it is very important that we stop cutting trees. We don't allow the animals to graze in the forest. You know, we don't, there, there was a practice that some people decide now there's more grass or there's more vegetation in the forest. They hide their animals in there. We become sort of like people who preserve the environment by ourselves without external intervention. A lot of our money goes back to the community. We work with Litane Mission Hospital. We've renovated the women's ward, surgical and uh, medical, the men's ward, and the maternity ward. We support Litane's children's home. We're also helping to build a school in Emitiot. So a lot of our money actually keeps just going back there. And also, we also buy from the community. So we're talking about, let's say, a thousand, you know, thousands of tons that there are people who have planted these herbs and are planting for us and we buy from them, and actually, we pay more for, for, for herbs. Let's say we could be paying anything like $4 a kilo, or $5 a kilo, compared to what they even get for their tea. The trade in this is actually more lucrative. And the reason we pay top dollar is to make sure people don't cut down trees. Because if you have a whole tendoid, for instance, you have the choice of either selling some of that to us, like the top branches, because it will regrow as long as you do sustainable harvesting. You have the choice of selling that to us, make $100, or cutting it down and make $20. So this, these are some of the incentives that we've put in place. And remember, we've been, in, we've been actually doing this for at least four years formally. We have retail outlet, outlets in Kisumu, Mombasa, Nakuru, Eldoret, uh, Kericho. We have retail outlets four in Nairobi, in Westlands, in Karen, in CBD, and in Gong Road. We're opening something in Garissa. The whole idea is to make it like a circular economy. People learn about the trees, and then they get the benefit from the, from, from, from the herbs. They get healed, or they get their pain is alleviated, or whatever it is that is happening to them. They talk about it to friends on WhatsApp. And so there's this circular thing going on, talking about trees, and people are getting into conservation. People are getting into like a little gardening, a little farming. People are saying, I'm healthy now. I drink green tea. Oh, I stopped doing X, Y, Z, I exercise more. And you can see the transformation in the society, especially with, with COVID now. People have to stay indoors or social distance. Now they do a lot more exercise. So this is, this is sort of how we have approached it holistically, right? So the retail angle is actually just 20% 20, 20 of the work that we do. And I'd say community engagement is 40% of the work that we do. And everything else is in between. The distributorship, the supply chain, the training, the research, etc. Mm. Okay, this is a question at the back. I thank you very much, both of you, and it's especially interesting listening to you after Dr. Nyairo's amazing, amazing um, keynote. So a question, Angela, for you, I was, I was wondering if you could, s you, you mentioned something about, you know, you're going back to some of the older records and how what is missing is the perspective on the people who are being reported on ourselves. And I'm wondering if you have any work or plans of working with older people right here in Nairobi. So our parents, our grandparents who may be here and who may want to get involved in the Macmillan from a point of view of, or, you know, I, I live near Kaloleni, I know the stories from, from wanting to engage and sharing that perspective. And maybe if you can talk a little bit about that. Because I noticed, like, with the storytelling, we're talking very much about younger storytellers or professional storytellers. And I'm wondering about all these people who do not define themselves as storytellers, but are our living memory. And then Harriet, I am just blown away. I was thinking of the tighter names of plants, but being too shy to shout them out in case I'm recorded giving the wrong name. <laughs> so I'm wondering, I noticed you're working in a very specific catchment area. If people are watching or listening and are thinking, I would love to be able to do that in my part of the country. I have no idea where to start, but that sounds completely fascinating. How, how might, you know, is there any way they might work with you or they might work 
to find out with you how they could do it from wherever they are. And thank you both for such great work because I think it's pushing some of the challenges that Dr. Nyairo gave us further. Thank you. Okay, Angela. Angela first. Okay, sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Mshai Mongola, for your question. Um, great question that you're asking. We're actually going live in April, um, targeting specifically um, that group of people. Um, Joyce Nairo, I think a couple of weeks ago, there was a tweet that you sent talking about the number of senior citizens that we have in the country. I can't remember the exact percentages, but it was, it was a small fraction of our general um, population. Was it two point something percent? I may be wrong. Um, but I remember looking at that tweet at that time because we were still formulating this project. And it really did help us think about the fact that we do need to specifically target senior citizens because we're talking about um, a small pop, uh, fragment of our population and also people who are quite old now, right? And so there's, there's quite an urgent need to get their perspectives on these things. Um, and informed by that, actually we're working with Professor Kimani Njogu. He will be interviewing senior citizens in particular, the ones that we're targeting for, for storytelling, I'm shy. And then I'm, I'm super happy to also share more information about that. For the first time ever, we're going to be able to make adverts on newspapers and on radio stations and in the you know, mainstream media. Um, if you know us well, you know that we firmly kind of comfortably sit in the social media space more than anywhere else. So this will be our first foray into that world. And I'm really looking forward to having people who are older come in, but also having people who are younger bring in um, you know, their relatives, their parents, older people in your lives. So we really do encourage you to please try and do this with us because it's going to be a very, very precious um, archive that, that we're able to co-curate. The idea is to co-curate with the public. Okay. Yeah, Harry. Yeah, so um, from what you have said, yes, this is something that we are working on. Remember, um, so the communities that we have already started working with are like the Giriyama in Malindi, also the Taita. Um, we've been talking to some Taita practitioners. We've also gone um, all the way to Nyanza. So um, over, the, over December, I, was, I spent a lot of time actually in, next to Lake Victoria. And this is how I got to know that actually this plant was there. So I picked up a lot of species and specimen to say, we have this. What do you call this in your, in your community? And beginning to that process of engaging with pe people from different um, communities and their practitioners. Because there's so much to do, there's so much knowledge, so much to do. We actually get overwhelmed with everything that we have to do. And the retail side, the demand is so huge for some of our products that the retail side sometimes just overwhelms us. We're just busy translating to the population in Nairobi or the population in Mombasa or population in Nakuru who want these things and they want to know what they do, how they work, what they're called, where we found them. They want to know about our processes. So, but we do actually have internships. Remember that the, our catchment area for the supply is because of what we know. We know that community and we've been working with them a long time, but we actually want to source from other communities, you know, when and if we can. At the same time, our catchment area might be in the Southern Rift, but our team is very diverse. Actually, most of my sales team and the people who do everything else in social media are from other communities. And this is deliberate, actually, so that it doesn't become an affair for one community, right? It becomes something that every Kenyan can participate. You know, whoever it is sitting on that sales team gets to learn, okay, this comes from South Rift, or this comes from the Maasai. This is how they use it. This is how I translate it in this context. And we also do have interns and provide internships. So going forward, we want to do a lot. We want to do more research. We want to do more training. We want to go all over Kenya. We want to go all over Africa, if, if, if I'm to be honest, right? I mean, we're heading to Kigali. We want to go to Ethiopia. There's so much going on in there in terms of traditional medicine. Eritrea is just a treasure trove. We have a lot of clients in Dar es Salaam and Arusha. You know, they write to us on our Instagram, in Instagram page in, you know, meticulous Kiswahili, and we have to think, oh my God, what have they said? You know, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of interaction also with that community who say we want this, we want this, we want that. So we're, we're quite busy, but we're very open to partnerships and training and any other support or any other interaction or any other engagement. There's, there's a question at the back um, and then there's a question in front here. So I think those are the two last questions. We can pick up the rest of the conversation at tea time. Let's have a question there and the question here. Hi, uh, my name is Deborah, and I'm pleased or um, privileged to hear you both speak. 
Um, my question is to Harriet. I've heard you speak um, concerning how you've involved uh, members of your community, but I haven't heard you connect to how you're dealing with the youth and particularly that particular... Um, the demographic. Yes, that demographic. Do you mind explaining how okay. it is that you... So when, when I first... The, um, I suffer from a condition called endometriosis. Actually, this is how I discovered the product because it was given to me because I used to go through debilitating period like since I was 17, like yonks and yonks, many, many years ago. I won't say how many, but many, many <laughs> years ago. So this product was given because of the pain I used to endure, and it was sort of like handed to me as a gift in 2017. I took the product, and when it worked for me, I gave it to my friend who was going through, about to go for a hysterectomy. And these are women who are in their 40s, and this is the crowd I was talking to, right? But I discovered when eventually I put it out there, the people who actually rushed to it the most were a group of young people in their early 20s who have had what's a condition called block tubes. And block tubes is caused mainly, but not only, but mainly by overuse of, uh, or abuse of over-the-counter contraceptives. So there's block tubes, there's ectopics, there's um, UTIs, urinary tract infections, which recur and cause scarring, and they block the tubes. So you meet young people, a 21-year-old, just finished campus, or 22 years, they want to get married, or they are married, but they can't have children. So this is the crowd I discovered. And then, of course, this really grew my business. I was shocked, because suddenly I had to start speaking that, you know, like, interesting lingua. I couldn't, I couldn't speak like, oh, like an oldie, because they'd be like, you're talking like an old person. Please explain this to me <laughs> in this particular way. And I made a lot of friends in that age bracket. And I, I can tell you the first year when my business shot up, it was that demographic. And of course, younger girls now, 18 or 19, who have terrible period pain, they don't go to school, like they're in boarding school, but they're laid out at the, at the sanatorium for like about a week. They're really interested in sorting out their hormonal issues, cleaning out their systems so they can have a regular life. At the same time, because of lifestyle changes, a lot of young people who are m abusing, again, the, the blue pill, number one, um, abusing steroids or taking medication that has a lot of side effects are struggling with premature ejaculation, um, erectile dysfunction, and prostate issues in their 20s. So this, for me, it, it was a, a big learning experience to discover that it's young people who want our products, right? And they are the fastest learners, and they want it on Instagram. When they message you, they want instant, like, I messaged you two seconds ago. Why have you not responded? So, you know, we had to now be quick, quick, quick. I had to learn about Instagram. I learned how to make reels. I'm like, <laughs> I mean, stories. Things which were not interesting to me before, but I had to now start speaking the language of the young people. So I hope that answers your questions. You know, we did start with an older demographic, but we're, we're right here talking to the youth. You know, if it's between 20 and 30, we're in there. Jerry, the last word. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tamothiambo. Um, it's, uh, it's been a great discussion. I've really enjoyed your conversations. And uh, it's a f uh, I mean, we've, we've worked with uh, Ashuka many times before, but it's the first time that I'm uh, getting to learn about the work that you're doing, Harriet, and really, it's really fascinating. One of, um, the question that I had is on um, what will it take to have that shift in the tide from dependence on modern medicine to traditional medicine? And if you have... Um, worked with or tried working with cultural influencers. I mean, you've just said we're in the age of influencing. It's young people who are buying your products. And I was just wondering if that's something that you've worked with or if it's something that you're, you're considering. Then um, to Angela, I think my question is um, some of this uh, historical uh, information in the archives that is being digitized, um, some of it is contentious. So, uh, are there plans or is there something that is being done about what we'd call a propaganda debunking? So some of the historical facts that have since been uh, proven to be um, you know, not true. A, a very good example that I can give is the book that uh, Dr. Odiambo talked about, uh, Leakey's book on uh, the Southern Kikuyu. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the grave uh, mistakes that the author made in the book is to say that the Kikuyu community had nine tribes based on the nine women because he did not understand the use of which basically means nine full which is how the Kikuyus used to used to refer to 
families, because we never used to count people in infinite, indefinite numbers. So you'd say Kedambo Yoru. And that is now went into record to show that Kikuyu had nine tribes, whereas in essence, Kikuyus had 10 tribes. And so what happened is that uh, along comes along Dr. Um, Professor Ngugi Wathiongo, who recently wrote a book on Kedambo Yoru to specifically address that um, fact that this had uh, been missed out and for a very long time, a lot of people used to believe that there are nine tribes. So Thank you. Yeah, um, really like the last word and then the last word and then we go for okay. the last word Let's in response to Njeri. Do you want to go first? No, you go. Just could you repeat your question again about the, the one that you directed to me? So there are two questions. One is shifting that tide from dependence on modern medicine. And the second question was use of cultural influences. Okay, so the shift has already happened because, um, you know, 80% of Africans actually use indigenous medicine, but they don't talk about it broadly. And some of this is just due to lack of access or lack of money to afford like hospitals or clinics or whatever. You'd be surprised at how many women, for instance, would prefer a traditional birth attendant over going into a hospital and having their baby there. So what I say is the shift is now happening in the urban areas because out there it's being used. The Turkana are using it, the Samburu, the Maasai are using it. So I'm a big believer in mix and match. I do believe in allopathic medicine. I believe in alternative medicine. I believe in traditional medicine. And the best combination is if we can mix it all. So that, for instance, you go for a diagnosis at a hospital with an allopathic doctor and if it is safe, you can use traditional medicine, introduce your traditional medicine that you're using to your allopathic doctor so they can tell you about drug interactions, so they can ask you about drug interactions. You can ask us about drug interactions. Can I use this along with this? Because I think that is really where we can grow. It's not about putting one aside and using one. You know, just the same way you can say you're going to do a detox by doing a water fast. At the same time, you will still take a painkiller. At the same time, you might chew on a root like some root like moringa or something to give you energy. At the same time, you go to the doctor who might say you have migraines, you need to do one, two, three. This is what's going on in your, in your life. So I'm of the opinion that we should mix it all up. I mean, medicine is medicine. We shouldn't discriminate against either or the other, right? Cultural influ influences, we're using a lot of them. And by that, I think you mean the people who sort of like make social media pop. So we have quite a few in influences, some who've suffered from um, endometriosis for years, and then they come and talk about it. We use radio stations a lot. Um, we use politicians as well. Um, we talk to doctors. We actually work with gynecologists. We, we talk to social scientists. So there's a lot of people that we engage all the time. Come, talk to us. Let's do a video. Let's do a live. Let's talk to an audience, that sort of thing. I mean, we work with institutions like the British Council and everybody else who, is, who would be interested in partnering with us to to sort of take this project forward. Okay. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. That's a great question. And I think it's, it's a question that um, would make a great return to, to our keynote speaker today. Um, Dr. Joyce Nyairo's book, Kenya at 50, and I'm paraphrasing here, but there is a part that talks about um, that one of the most glaring fault lines in, in the making of our history um, is not necessarily the lack of information or I'm paraphrasing, I'm butchering this, but rather the, um, the institutionalization of amnesia. So the question that you're asking, which is, I think for me, to do with two kinds of memory. So you have one that you may call state sanction, for example, um, or any memory that is written down that tells us this is our story. And then you have, I think, what in a small way we're attempting to do, which is bring public memory into it. Often what people remember um, and what people know and what is recorded as history or as memory um, differ. So I think that there's value in having um, a text that misidentifies, right, um, the kind of information that you're talking about, and then a correction by a member of the public who says, no, actually, that's not the case. This is the case. And then having, in a public library, the safety of knowing that you can have access to both and that demystifying it debunking it, mixing it. I see Joyce mixing her hands. <laughs> um, and she said Ari, earlier, one of the things that we do is submerge, we mix, and then we take out what's useful to us and we keep it moving, right? But I think um, in closing, 
that's kind of the huge point of, of, of public libraries, about having these institutions that have all sorts of information um, that you can go and access and choose and mix what you want to add to through projects like this, choose what works for you and what doesn't, and where it's possible, add your own version and your own correction. Yeah, I mean, thanks, um, the two speakers. I mean, this is really fascinating. My last word is that uh, uh, my teacher spoke about the national cultural policy. And I'm amazed that it has taken this long for the government finally to actually have a fund to support the arts and the cultures after these many years. And all these efforts will not really bear fruits unless we actually find the means and mechanism to fund them uh, locally. If we depend on somebody signing a check somewhere else, let's not even talk about agenda. There's just no money in the world. And I think the two efforts by, by Angela and Harriet uh, show that there is enough energy around, there is enough creativity around, there's enough wisdom around, and I think there are possibilities around. Thank you very much for being patient and listening to this. Mm -hmm.